Hey guys, thanks for joining and welcome to our 31st video on ProjectOiler.net. Today we're going to be taking a look at Problem 31, Coin Sums. So the problem reads, in the United Kingdom the currency is made up of pound and pence. There are eight coins in general circulation. Here is one possible way we can combine those coins to make a total of two pounds. They're asking us how many different ways can two pounds be made using any number of coins. So this is actually an instance of a pretty famous type algorithm where we count coins in order to get to a particular sum. So this is the type of thing that'll be taught in colleges a lot or just programming courses in general. And the way we can implement a solution is to use something called dynamic programming where we essentially solve sub problems, then keep track of their solutions and keep going until we get to the actual problem at hand. So I'll go ahead and implement that solution and I'll show you what I mean as I go. So let's go to our workspace and create a code file. I'm going to be coding this in TypeScript, which is an extension of JavaScript, superset. So if you're not familiar with the language, the syntax is very similar to most common programming languages, so you should have no troubles following along in this video. And I'm going to be coding this in a class, which is not required per se. I just want to take advantage of some utilities I've written to run the program. Okay, so here we are. I've created the file and I've made a method get num choices where we have the limit, which will set to 200 when we solve the problem, or we can set it to something smaller for debugging purposes, and the choices, which corresponds to the coins we can use. So I was saying that we can take a dynamic programming approach. What I mean by that is we can start with smaller problems and keep track of their solutions, and then we assemble the pieces from there until we get to the real solution. So I'm going to define a two by two number array, or we can call it a matrix, and this will keep track of it. So I'm gonna call it const sub problem matrix is equal to a number matrix is equal to this. So the first row will correspond to how we can make how many ways we can make change if we have zero choices. So that is going to be zero. So sub problem matrix dot push new array choices dot length dot fill zero. And the reason we're doing that is we just have a baseline value of choices which we can use to assemble the pieces later. So I'll make a comment when there are no choices we have no ways to make the change. Actually, this isn't choices.link, this is limit. So if the limit is 20, for example, we'll have a two-dimensional array with 20 columns. Now, each so each column corresponds to, the, to a limit, or a sublimit, we'll say, the last column being the limit itself. So what will the rows be? The rows will be the choices that we have. So first what I'll do up here is just for safety, I'll say choices.sort, A, B goes to A minus B. So now we have them in non-decreasing order. So in each row, we will introduce a new choice. So we'll say choices dot for each choice. One thing I forgot is the first column will actually be one itself. So the first column in the first row, because we can actually make change of zero cents or zero pence with zero items. So the array will actually be limit plus one dot length to include the number zero and sub problem matrix zero one will be one. And I'll make a comment. We can make change for zero pence with zero coins. I'll make that note there. And then for each choice, determine the number of ways we can make change for column. So there's two parts to this. One is the number of choices we can make with the addition of the new coin plus the previous number of choices essentially. So we'll make a variable constant previous coin choices is equal to subproblem matrix index minus one. So, sorry, we actually needed two dimensional array here. So, well, I'll make two for loops for let i is equal to zero, i is less than equal to limit, i plus plus. That needs to be the inner iterator, not the outer one. I'm going to name it limit iterator for our clarity. I'll make a first loop for let coin index is equal to zero. Actually, what I can do is I can bring this inside of the choices dot for each itself. Choice index. Then this condition we bring inside the for loop. 
So in other words, for each choice, we're iterating over the items between zero up to an including limit. So we need the subproblem matrix limit iterator minus one choice index. Other way around. Choice index minus one limit iterator. So in other words, we're going to be adding the choices we could make before to the choices we can make now. I'm making one called now choices column index. So we're going to say take the current choices that we have from before and add to it the number of choices we would have if we subtracted the current limit by the current coin. So we're going to say limit iterator minus choice. So if choice, if the choice column index is less than zero, we, we can't do it. So I have to actually make this thing greater than equal to zero. Right, so in other words, if the current limit is less than the actual coin value, we can't use that coin, so. Instead of making an if condition, I'll say now choice plus is equal to is greater than negative one, previous We'll say some problem matrix choice index, limit index minus, actually no, no, just, we already did that calculation. Now choice column index, otherwise zero, indicating if you can't use it, just don't add any more choices. Then we'll set sub problem matrix choice index, limit index is equal to previous coin choices plus now coin plus, now choice plus that is. So that's how we're going to dynamically build the results based on the subproblems, right? We take the previous choices from before, add the current choices we have with the current coin, if there are any, and set that the value of that subproblem to the addition of those two terms. And what we'll find is that at the end, the bottom right most value will be the actual answer to the overall question, which means that at the end we can return subproblem matrix subproblem so matrix dot length minus one. I'll make a different variable just for readability const subproblem last row is equal to subproblem matrix subproblem matrix dot length minus one. And then we're going to return the last item of the last row, subproblem matrix row, subproblem last row dot length minus one. So there we have the actual answer itself. Let's verify, see if it's correct. So what we'll do is we'll use some smaller input of, first we'll use one and the only choice, well I'll set the choices to one, two, or five to make sure that we still only get the number one, which we should because there's only one way to make one cent and that is with one coin, one one pence coin. So let's run it and see what we get. Cannot read property zero of undefined choices dot four each. It looks like we have some type of bug here. I'm wondering if we're overriding this value somewhere accidentally. What I'll do is I'll just turn that into a for loop for let choice it is equal to zero. Choice it is less than choices dot length. Choice it plus plus. Const choice. I'll call it choice index to preserve the naming we used there. Const choice is equal to choices, choice index. So I'm not sure why the bug existed in the first place, but we should be able to remove it or debug further by changing this into a for loop. So let's go ahead and run that again. Kind of read property zero of undefined. Oh, I understand. So we, we're not pushing the new rows. What I'm going to do is at this stage, when we set the for each choice, I'm just going to push a new row and initialize it with zero values. Subproblem matrix dot push. Essentially, we we're trying to access rows in this matrix, which we never initialized. Also, each choice, I'm going to set choice index to one, and this will be choice index minus one, because the first row corresponds to no choices at all, so we need to actually keep in mind that if we have the first choice, that is the actual first index of the subproblem matrix. Okay, so this time we got the correct answer, and we can remove this console logging here. Let's try the value two. We should be getting two, we should be getting two here, right? Because we have the coin two itself and one plus one coins. So what I'll do is I'll console log the subproblem matrix here and we can see what the values of the matrix itself are. 
Okay, so that was just a dumb bug. This has to be zero, zero, not zero, one. I don't know why that happened, but let's run it again. Okay, now that looks correct. I'm gonna remove this console.log for now. So if we have the number three, how many choices will we get? We can do three times one pence, two pence plus one pence. Yeah, those are the only choices. We should still get two. If we say four, we can have four times one pence, two two pence plus two two pence, and then two plus one plus one. So we should get three. Okay, let's go ahead and run this on the full input and see what we get and how fast it takes. Let's see what we get. 73682 in two milliseconds. That's very fast if the answer is correct. So let's go ahead and check this and see if it's correct. Okay, th that is the correct answer and it only took two milliseconds. So like I said in the beginning, this is essentially an instance of one of the somewhat commonly well-known computer science algorithms. So I knew this going in. It had been a while since I studied it, so I kind of had to work through a few bugs, but overall we got the answer pretty quickly and it only took two milliseconds, which is impressively fast. So just one quick note, if we had not taken this type of approach, an alternative approach would have been to just check what choice we have at each step. So the first coin we selected, it could have been any coin, but the second coin we selected, we would have had limitations. Like no matter what coin we select at first, we couldn't select the two pound coin after that because we would be over our limit. In that sense, we could represent it like a tree of choices where each child node contains the choices that we have, but that would have been a lot slower than this type of dynamic approach. So I'm satisfied with the approach that we've taken today. So that covers the content for this video. If you made it to the end, please leave a like, subscribe, hit that bell icon for notifications for more Project Euler videos. I'm gonna be posting these at rate one per day, 12 o'clock noon, until we have 100 videos up, 100 problems solved. Thanks for watching.